Uh, how open textbooks will change your life. Welcome everybody. Um, my name is David Yates. We're joined today um, by three fantastic panelists, Dr. Amanda White, Dr. Sarah Lambert, and Dr. Maya Svartea. Um, I would like to start off um, with an acknowledgement of country. Um, I acknowledge that the UTS built campus stands on the ancestral lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora nation, the Budaburangal people of the Darug nation, uh, the Vidyagal people and the Gamagal people. I also, I'd also like to pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for these lands. Um, since we're all here today remotely, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands from which you join us today and pay respects to those elders past, present and emerging. Um, personally, I'm here on Dangadi country, um, so I acknowledge the elders of this place and that their sovereignty of these lands was never ceded. Um, if you don't know much about Dangadi country, there's much that can be told, but um, I'd like to share one piece of important uh, recent history. Um, you, you probably know, um, hopefully you'd know, you'd have heard of the great Eddie Koiki Mabo, whose case raised against the Australian government resulted in a 1992 decision to overturn the legal fiction of Terra Nullius, um, and the land stolen in the Torres Strait, where, um, um, where he was from, were returned to the peoples, um, there under what became known as the Native Title Act. Um, but however, it wasn't until 1996 that under this act, um, the first successful land claim was negotiated uh, with the New South Wales government on mainland Australia. And that occurred here on Nangadi country, um, down the ways a little bit uh, at a place known in English, uh, in the English language as Crescent Head. Now, there's a lot more detail to that story and to those events, and it certainly doesn't end in 1996. It's quite a fraught history. Um, so I encourage you to, to look it up, especially if you um, live on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. Um, the, this is sort of relevant to our discussion today because part of the reason that we're passionate about open textbooks is that they allow you to enrich and edit them with information that's relevant to your local context and your personal expertise. So I'm really honoured uh, to call on the personal expertise of three amazing people today. Um, one of those people is Dr. Amanda White, and um, Amanda is an education-focused academic whose um, research focuses on teaching and learning aspects of accounting, education, and academic integrity. Um, in recognition of Amanda's dedication to teaching and learning practices, she was awarded an AAUT citation in two, 2017 for her contribution to the support of student learning. Um, AAUT stands for Australian Awards for University Teaching, in case you didn't know. And then in 2021, uh, she was recognised with the AAUT Teaching Excellence Award for Business Law and Economics and Related Fields. Amanda is currently leading a project to develop two OER textbooks uh, for undergraduate business students. Um, uh, Amanda's, um, in addition to that, there's one thing that hasn't, hasn't been mentioned in this uh, brief bio is that Amanda runs a fabulous YouTube channel called Amanda Loves to Audit. So check that out. Um, I never thought accounting could be as fascinating as, as Amanda makes it in that, in that channel. Um, there's been a lot of David talk time so far. Amanda, uh, how did you get to the point um, before I introduce Sarah and, and Mace, I wanted to ask you, you a little question. How did you get mm -hmm. to the point of, of um, deciding that you wanted to publish your own open textbook? Um, I'd made a lot of open resources, I, I guess, you know, open in that anybody could use them and, and download them on YouTube. And that was sort of where I started because students found them useful and they were saying, can I share this with a friend? And it was the university that pushed me onto YouTube because they said I was taking up too much service space with all my videos. Um, and I went to a workshop with Mays uh, that uh, a discussion that she had organized. I can't remember if it was last year or the year before. And I thought like, I love this idea of a textbook you give away that's open, that people can edit, that we can co-create. And then when, the university approached me about teaching introductory accounting in a brand new format um, and I could do whatever I liked and I'd just been to Maze's workshop and I knew Sarah, I thought 
if I'm going to go, let's just go big. Hence, we're doing two books, <laughs> not just one. We're going with two books. And, um, you know, we're really pushing the envelope here down in the business school. That's brilliant. It sounds like things really aligned really nicely um, for this for this to happen. Thanks. Um, another one of these amazing people we've got on the panel today is Dr. Sarah Lambert. Um, Sarah is a leading researcher, collaborator and uh, practitioner of social justice and widening participation in education. Uh, currently an honorary research fellow at Deakin University, her research explores gendered and sociocultural barriers to education mediated by technology. Sarah is also the chief investigator of the Australian research project, Open Textbooks as Social Justice, a national scoping study funded by the National Centre for Student Equity in um, Higher Education, the N-C-S-E-H-E. Um, and you can, um, it's, there's, I forgot to mention at the bottom of that slide, there's also just, um, uh, Sarah's Twitter handle as well, Sarah Lambert Oz. Um, Sarah, before I go on to introduce Mace, I wanted to ask you, ask you a question here. Um, this is probably a question that's too big to answer in a few sentences, but where, um, for a real newbie like me, where does, where does, where do open textbooks converge, uh, and support social justice? I think um, up until recently, it's just, it, it's been uh, expensive textbooks and attacking just the cost issue, like a student's coming to staff and going, well, we just can't be paying $120 for a textbook that we may or may not use very much. What else have you got? <laughs> and in, uh, um, where was it, Deacon, um, some staff going, oh, look, here's an alternate one you can use and popping, putting open textbook op options up on their website and then sort of just letting students get on with it. And then um, it's just more recently, I think, as digital editing has become and digital publishing and digital platforms and all the cool digital tools that we have a bit are so sort of supported and DIY with the universities that the, the what you can do inside the textbook is, is more under the microscope. And from a social justice perspective, um, when you start to really look at what we say about our disciplines, who's an expert, who says it, who gets to be the knowledge holders, who gets to be, you know, Professor Wonderful, who says all the cool things about the, the foundations of your discipline. It's been a bit white and it's been a bit male. <laughs> and, and life and disciplines are not like that. And most disciplines are doing some work on that already. And they're mixing up their guest lectures and making sure they don't have manuals, male or panels and stuff. So it's a natural kind of thing to just look inside the content of your textbook and make sure that it's, it's sort of not lagging. Um, and we just find Indigenous knowledge is an area where we're pretty much all um, um, interested to step up a little bit and um, and some sort of global perspectives and some the mixture of global and local um, and what that does to make students who are not you know white and middle class feel like they belong in the profession because they their, their communities their cultures their businesses case studies are in the textbook and their experts are cited as people who know good stuff like we think that makes a difference to people's actual experience so that's those are the aspects of social justice the cost to get the book and then the actual justice of how things are represented in the book. Mm. Yeah, so it's actually coming at it from several different angles, yeah. isn't it? Um, Social justice it. has three. The money, who you recognise, and then who has a voice. So it's what, who, what you see and what you hear, as well as if you can afford to get it in the first place. So, yeah, it's a big, big theory. Yeah. Um, and that's why I recommend everybody check out um, the Open Textbooks uh, Australian Urban Textbooks website. Oh, thanks, Helen. You put that in the in the chat there. Um, that's that's the, that's um, sort of the website which is documenting um, the work that Sarah is is doing. Um, our third panelist um, is Dr. Mayes Fatea. Mayes um, is an educational technology specialist, learning designer, and early career researcher. Currently, she's working as a learning designer technology specialist at the University of Technology, Sydney. Her research interests focus on the use of technologies in learning and teaching, um, open educational resources, um, otherwise known as OERs, uh, learning design, design-based research. Her PhD thesis is titled Towards a Sustainable OER Model, Tapping into the Cognitive Surplus of Student-Generated Content. 
Um, this presents the design principles of adopting OER in learning and teaching. Uh, following on from a doctoral work, Mace has utilised her experience in teaching and research in enhancing the adoption of technology in learning and teaching practices in tertiary education. Mace is also another person on this panel um, who's, who's won some awards for her work and most recently um, the UNESCO Award for Excellence in OER Implementation. I always like to plug that because it was a very, very, that was for 2021, very recently that one, Mace won that uh, little award there. Um, uh, Mace, is it, is it, I think in your experience, is it unlikely that someone will find an existing OER text that's going to be suitable uh, or aligned to their topics? Um, thank you for the introduction and it's uh, an honor to be up with the panel today. Um, I think, um, when we're talking about academics experience and how they actually respond to finding what they actually after yes i do think it is sometimes challenging uh, to find something that respond to the needs of the learning environment um, respond to the, the uniqueness of the context so and it, this is very typical example when we're talking about uh, accounting we're talking about nursing in australia it's different to how it's practiced elsewhere so um, these are some of the areas and uh, again um, to the uh, wide benefits of open textbooks that has been already realized we still have this room here to address some of the gaps around um, for example the big one original knowledge so um, there are some that exist but i think um, from recent um, kind of informal interviews with academics across several faculties at UTS, I came across um, academics from the Faculty of Law, for example, and it was like, this is really challenging. It is a very unique context. Um, our uh, textbooks actually has to be at that level of standards, they're peer reviewed they not easy uh, it's not easy for us to just go and uh, adopt um, open textbooks that are not reviewed by our people and this is becoming really challenging in these specific areas so yeah i do think it is yeah it's a it's a massive piece of work isn't it um and i think even just raising raising people's awareness that open textbooks exist that they're an option for their, for their teaching as well is really is a really big big piece of work as well um hopefully events like this today are contributing to to raising some of that um awareness and making it seem like a viable option for for more people as well um on that note um i was like to to throw something over to to the the audience now um and um ask everyone to participate in a in a quick uh mentee poll um the link i think helen's just shared the link um in the chat there um if you can just jump over and let us know what you think about open textbooks right now and i'll just um Give us a few minutes. Hopefully, the responses start popping up there. There are a few questions in that in that poll, but feel free to um, jump on to the next question if you've already answered this one. Cool. Thank you, everyone, who's, who's responded to that. Um, really interesting to see uh, how positive the the response is to the idea of of I would use open textbooks. Uh, we're we're about fifty fifty in in terms of respondees there in terms of who's familiar with open textbooks, who has, has seen one before, um, and very positive response to the idea that open textbooks should be the default in all subjects. Um, and yeah, still still. Um, 
we have some ideas here around like that. I threw that question in to sort of um, as as the as the, the challenge to this is they're unlikely to make a difference to teaching practices. Um, so these are these are really interesting results. Um, Amanda, Mace, and Sarah, would you have any? Do you have any? Uh, reflections on what people are saying in the poll here, from what you can see. <laughs> Sarah, yeah, go for it. Um, this is uh, open textbooks, maybe not hugely visible in Australia, but massive in Canada and North America, where they um, they don't have the Australian Higher Education Act that that means you can't charge students for resources. Like we are amazing. We we just think that everyone is like us and the library is just a huge player in books, but it's not always the case. So overseas is sort of 15 years advanced. Now Rajiv Jangiani in Kwantlen Polytechnic Uni in the northern part of Canada, they're, they're doing massive invested work over more than a decade as many institutions there are. And his favourite quip is, they come for the free books, but they stay for the pedagogy. <laughs> and it's just a massive thing. It, it's just again and again, it's like, oh, we thought we'd start with this, but now what we get really passionate about is our control, our complete control over what we want the classroom narrative to be, the, the scaffolding for all our stuff, the way that it supports our assignments. Um, and so Rajiv's his um, background is psychology, he's taught psychology for a long time, he's developed open psychology textbooks and he, you know, I, th I don't know if it was more five or eight years ago, kind of first got into co-creating quizzes with students so that they could maximise the amount of additional supplementary resources and how that's sitting with their assessment and everything. So, so um, while um, some people think textbooks are sort of outdated and they don't use them at all in some disciplines, they just don't do textbooks. It's just not a thing. They do journal articles and they do multimedia and they do um, chapters here and there and reading lists. But um, yeah, and, and, and some people say textbooks are really old hat anyway, and why do we even bother? <laughs> but it's amazing. Um, about 80% of the people who did our survey still really use a, a textbook or, you know, substantial check chapters from so um, if you make those more flexible from an academic perspective yeah it can change teaching practice so I think this is somewhere this will be our projected journey I reckon moving forward yeah and it's uh, you raise a, a really great point there I, I think I think um, this is something Mace that that you know a lot about and that's um, it's not just about the the, the textbook itself but the fact that you can have students generating the textbook, it becomes like an educational experience as well. Mace, you, you um, have presented on, on this idea a lot as well. Tell us a little bit. Yeah, and um, the teaching, teaching practices, I think, is a, is a key word here. Um, how do you actually use open textbooks? Uh, not for the, uh, the big benefit, which is cutting costs. This is massive. This is great. But what about other things that open textbook bring to the learning environment? And um, you would be surprised that many would, uh, many academics actually would be okay with the cutting cost aspect. But still, uh, what about the pedagogy? What about how do we actually use these resources? Or the idea of open pedagogy. In, um, in the learning environment. And I think this is important. And uh, there's been recent talk about um, uh, resistance to adopting uh, and um, open textbooks in, in the learning environment because um, we don't really have the tools to actually to use them there. And given the benefits, there's probably a um, few evidences of how that works actually in, um, with the students with all the elements that we have in the learning environment, how does it actually work um, uh, to, to improve the learning experience? Uh, Amanda talked about engaging students in generating um, open textbooks and uh, a, a very recent also textbook has been generated by students in the University of Southern Queensland, which is one of the lead in, in this area. And uh, the idea was actually tapping into what students generate inside the classroom um, we're using uh, assessment or with the idea of renewable assessment. So all these pockets of what is inside the classroom and how to actually design teaching practices um, or teaching approaches, let's say, that uh, utilize the uh, 
the wide benefits of open textbooks is not really re uh, realized. And I think uh, probably people in the learning design domain and people in educational technology can contribute to that, um, giving that the technology, the, the uh, learning technologies provide the nice platform to allow collaboration, to allow the generation, allow um, um, generating content that is accessible. So um, I think there is a lot of room there uh, for um, open textbooks that are what, as they are integrated in the, in the teaching practices. And it's not surprised to, to see that uh, the orange bar is at that point. So uh, it actually aligns with what I found talking to many academics across UTS just recently. So um, that's kind of con confirms what uh, we have seen in the in real life. I just um... I, I, I want to hear from Amanda on this as well, but I just wanted to read out a comment that, that Sarah made while you were speaking, Mace, which is really lovely. Um, she said, first, can I just publicly acknowledge Mace's amazing work? She's famous internationally, you lucky UTS people. Um, and we really are lucky. So um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really fantastic to, to share, you know, this work environment with you and, and to, to get your expertise. And the fact that you are internationally recognized means that you can do great things like you can bring people um, from uh, from overseas to UTS and do great um, sessions like you've done um, in the last 12 months to, to promote OER here. So it's it's fantastic. Um, yeah, Amanda, yeah, how, to, how it, looking at this poll, does it does mm -hmm. it reflect your experience at all? I think so. Yeah, academics are so time poor and I think COVID has just exacerbated um, what we need to do in terms of teaching and learning and changes of assessment and considering academic integrity. Um, for those academics who are 40, 40, 20, I think, you know, they are spending 40% of their time um, in a work week on this type of work. And so I think the scary thing about OER is a lot of people think I have to write a whole book. Oh my God, I have to write a whole book. Um, and you know, historically you wrote a textbook as a subject matter expert, you went to a publisher and that was the capitalist reward for doing this. And I added this as one of the comments. I think there's a, the next question after this one was a, an open question, but for me, you know, open textbooks is academic work in its purest form because we're not doing it for the money and we're not doing it for the prestige. We're doing it because we want to support student learning and to support our peers and support our colleagues. Um, and for me, and I was always doing that on YouTube, whether I was getting, you know, ad revenue or not ad revenue, but you know, the idea of writing something and then giving it away and making it available to so many people, I think really pulls at the reason why I became an academic. I became an academic, not because I wanted to be, it wasn't the research that pulled me in. It was the teaching. And the research is the side, it's the side <laughs> hustle that, that sort of, you know, I have to balance out with, but you know, that really called to me as this is why I'm here in higher ed. I left my high paying big four accounting job to really have an impact and help, help people in terms of my students. Uh, yeah. And it seems like increasingly the, the, the financial sort of benefits of going with a for-profit publisher are diminishing for for um for writers for people who write you know um so many people really david writing. they yeah. they say oh i earned two dollars fifty what on earth did i yeah. do with that for and yeah. it, right. people it are just... starting to tell me that as well it's like well, if oh. i'm gonna write a book i might as well just give it away and, and <laughs> this is a this is a real moment in time it is a real moment in time where the financial rewards are just ridiculous compared to the um the effort and uh, i've also interviewed a number of academics who then the publisher declined to update their textbook, declined to let them progress with it, but declined to give them the license back so they could do it. So they are lost in space. Like, and this was um, an 110,000 word life's work that nobody, they declined to allow people to have it online. <laughs> so if as an academic, 
you are thinking of writing a commercial textbook and there are, are very good reasons why with Brandon Reach. So I'm not, I'm not, there's no hard and fast, but do really go and talk to your library staff and read the contract details because there are huge differences and some will lock you out of ever owning your stuff and making changes to it or having it released. So I, I heard some true horror stories of people who said, I wish I'd never signed that thing and I'm locked into it now. So just just do the due diligence on it. All contracts are so not equal in this space. Yeah, I probably fall into that category. I found my name on a book in Canada for something that I had written and I'd obviously just, you know, it was a, a case study workbook type of thing and then the publisher had taken it and then they had adapted it in another country and nobody ever told me about it until somebody wrote to me on YouTube and said, Amanda, do you know anything about this book in Canada? I'm like, well, that's my name. And that was the original source material that was adapted, but no, nobody had ever told me about it. Yeah. And they've got the rights to do that stuff. And now that you're mm -hmm. probably famous on YouTube, they probably think that it's a great time to leverage your, <laughs> what, your thing that you signed ages ago. Anyway, <laughs> enough from me on that one. <laughs> I'm going to leave the mentee there, but we'll come back to that. Um, I've wanted to talk about creating open textbooks. Like, uh, obviously that's not the only thing you can do when it comes to, to open textbooks. Um, Macy recently wrote about, um, using the as is adapting, re remixing, um, or developing your own. Uh, but Amanda, can you, for someone who's done it, um, doing it, what are your we top, what, doing it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, yeah. Um, what are your top tips for developing your own open textbook? I, I think be, you know, first one is be brave enough to start. And that might even just be in a small chunk. Now, of course I can't do anything small scale. So of course I said, I'm, we're going to write two books. Um, but it's, it's really have some talk to your library. Sarah mentioned, I went to my library staff. I talked to Maze about this. I talked to Sarah about it before we decided, you know, go ahead and jump in. And we've gone with the, some parts we're writing ourselves and some parts we are remixing out of very well recognized and very well used uh, books on OpenStax and lyrics in accounting. Um, and then adding that, you know, Australian flavor, we're looking at them from diversity, but it's give yourself lead time and then work out the plan of how you want to um, write the book. Um, and it, it can be written in Word. You could do it in Google Docs. Like it doesn't have to be on a platform. Um, and then, you know, we talk to our library. Um, and I don't think I probably talked to enough people when I started. I was like Sarah and I were like, yeah, we're doing it. And off we started. And then somebody got wind of it and said, oh, the library's keen. Can you have a talk to them? So I talked to the library or the UTS librarian, big shout out to Michael Gonzalez. And he's like, yeah, we'll pay for this. And I'm like, what? So I was, you know, thinking, how do I scratch the funds to pay for a platform and, and the bits and pieces that we needed? And he said, this is cheaper than the licenses we pay a textbook company. Um, and so, you know, talking to as many people as you can in your organization and then you know, just, just give it a start. And uh, it actually ends up being easier than you think. And I thought, oh, will I be subject matter expert enough to be able to write this? Some of the stuff I'm like, wow, I've forgotten that I knew all of this, but other parts and, you know, we're taking an introductory perspective from accounting that is trying to consider lots of different perspectives of numeracy and where does counting and accounting come from in Asian contexts, in indigenous Australian contexts, in the Western centric context from the Middle East, uh, you know, way back to Mesopotamia. And when Sarah and I started digging into indigenous perspectives, then we just realized how much we didn't know and how it was important then to, you know, reach out. And I was really lucky that Sarah had contacts, but a lot of these people doing open education work are just so keen to collaborate that, you know, you find somebody that might be uh, publishing something or is in the space, uh, you know, really reach out to those people and say, Oh, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Can I pick your brain for 30 minutes? Or are you interested in collaborating? Um, because again, you know, open textbooks for me, it's rising tides lifts all boats is, is really my philosophy around education. Hope that helps. That's fantastic. What did you find? Uh, have you noticed what the attitudes towards open textbooks are in 
in the accounting discipline or business more generally? <laughs> People were like, Amanda, why don't you write a book through a publisher and then you could make money? Or why don't you self-publish the book? Right? So you find a publisher and it, it, it you know, charge students whatever price and because you're self-publishing you're not going to a publisher you're making more of the money and to me that wasn't the reason why we wanted to do it didn't want to do this as a, a financial aside and so you know i had a lot of oh that's a really interesting concept and a lot of people are very curious um but i'm not sure that many people are like yeah let's write one for a different uh topic area but hopefully this will be a really great test case of how the process works, what you need to make it work and set time for writing and deadlines and working in a team and collaboration is all in there as well. Um, but, you know, nationally, when I've been talking about this with people, people are like, that's a cool idea. I don't know if I could do it or I don't know if, you know, I, I could go down that route. Um, but in talking to students, students are like, that is so cool. I can come to uni and $200 worth of books is something I don't have to worry about. Um, and they so, yeah, can know it's that's, really up to date, the total know uh, absolute up to, up to date on all, on all aspects. But I reckon, um, my prediction is that we will see, um, I reckon up to 25% of Australian undergrad accounting picking this book up within five years, because the Australian accounting standards, when Amanda smashes that in terms of aligning this book out of America, you know, it's not going to be long before all the bright sparks out there go, hmm, why wouldn't we specify this textbook and also pr provide this, you know, this, um, this great uplift of an up-to-date Australian thing for, for no cost to students. So I think that, um, and we've seen this overseas as well, and just locally too, I want to acknowledge um, La Trobe had, did a really early investment here down at La Trobe Uni in um, Melbourne and did their own um, e-textbook production house within the library and they've been putting titles out there for some time and already they've seen them being picked up overseas and locally and that was one of the things that surprised not to talk out of turn and this is Stephen who's in the audience is his interview is on my blog <laughs> says that I'm citing Stephen on my blog that that was one of the um and the academics too who wrote the books one of their surprise um outcomes and let's give a shout out to Stephen's La Trobe event I think Thursday Mm, a couple of those key academics are, are doing a, a um, this is what we did and they're, they're kind of at that nice end of the arc um, where they've we've, they've had it out in some teaching cycles they've had it picked up so I reckon yeah we're going to see a similar thing for this project. There's going to be groundswell from students as well that's the thing I've mm -hmm. noticed from YouTube yep. if students are feeling like what they're getting from their institution and their teachers is lacking they're going to search and find resources in other places. And so that might be that they're searching for introductory accounting on YouTube. They come across one of our short snippets. The description of the video points them to the book. They go to the book and they're like, shit, this is free. Mm. Okay. And they can pick right. that up without so, someone specifying it. And that happens mm. too. And just before we leave the big size project, I just want to say it's really okay to just write a chapter. It's really okay to just do four case studies of student work, top and tail it with a little introduction and a reference and have a, a nice, super sweet, small, very focused textbook that's actually addressing a particular module that isn't covered. And, and that's the great thing about open textbooks because they don't need to be commercial to exist. They don't need to be 36 48 chapters which is what commercial keep keep on making the thing bigger to make it feel like you're getting a lot of value but then the academics can only <laughs> still use six or eight or maybe ten chapters so it's nuts um so my colleague at charles darwin uni who did a co-creation had four student assignments became four one each chapter she topped and tailed it with six an amazing oer not a big deal at all it was part of the teaching process so you can go small so if you're don't don't think you have to go big going big is just amanda going big or going home and i must say sarah's a bit go big or go home so we're a bit dangerous together yes, but that's, that's, the rest that's of we get the on normal so well people, together <laughs> the normal people just do like two chapters and then next year another two and then you keep teaching and then the next thing you've got 10 chapters so it's small is very beautiful with oer um that's that's uh 
another really interesting angle to to the to OERs, isn't it? The sustainability of them, um, and working in technology, um, we do think about think about you know the sustainable or the re reusability of teaching resources as well. And the thing about these massive um, you know textbooks is that eventually they they sort of they get outdated if they're coming from a for-profit well, publisher. The number of times yeah. I've sent a correction to a book mm. and three versions later, the error is still there. And I have to say to my students, this is wrong. Just ignore this. And, you know, we really like the idea that if students thought something was unclear and maybe we have a discussion on a discussion forum about that particular sentence or that particular component, we think actually that'd be really great to go into the book. We can add that into the book with the student's permission include them as contributors and co-creators of knowledge. I did want to have some form of additional extra credit assessment task potentially for students to co-create with the book, but I realized that potentially sometimes extra credit assessments create equity issues for students who are working full-time, caring, etc. But you know we're still going to invite students and we have a really strong students as partners approach here as well. So they, our students are going to be part of our review team. So we have a number of students who will be paid as reviewers to review the text. They're our past leaders, our you past leaders, um, and they will be reviewing the text and giving their thoughts from that student perspective. Um, they've seen a wide spectrum of students as well as academic reviewers. So we want them to be part of that process. And Sarah's work on the open textbook process um, and what students saw in themselves in texts was, is really important as well to informing how we go through this process. And I think that though we're paying those students too, like you got a little bit of budget from, there's a question about resourcing. So you got a little bit of top up funding from your department to pay the student side of things and the library chipped in for some production side of things. Now we have um, the Council of Australian University Librarians offering a free press books platform for people to, to, to do textbooks in. So the actual um, investment costs, each individual uni doesn't have to come up with their own press books platform, which is a very common platform that you can digitally author. You know, you put for the tech savvy people, it's, you know, docs in, Google docs in, lots of ins, and then it, it creates um, a web-based textbook, which you can also generate all of these different digital outcomes. So when we say open textbooks, yes, you can print it out, but it's super digital. So it's digital first, actually, and that means the fact that it's it's also easy to update. So these are the different kinds of pockets of funding for the bigger projects. But the national research, we had numerous academics saying, "Look, I just I just want to do a small project. I just want I want access to to support staff time. I want to have a graphic designer do my diagrams. I want to have someone help me search for for more up to date stuff, and then I'm going to do it as part of my teaching prep as long as I can get the expertise in the library in the graphic design sort of area. So um, the resourcing requirements are different again depending on whether you're wanting to do a small um, a small focused piece of OER as part of your teaching prep or a big thing um, or um, as a sort of business as usual like course upgrade or when you've got curriculum renewal when you already have extra workload assigned people are saying oh well we're gonna when we do that project we're gonna make sure we collate together and and do OER so the resourcing is very different but clearly at, there were many academics who experienced in this who said look I don't have time for the big project I'm going to do the small one and I just I, I, I'm happy to do some marking buyout but really I just I don't want to buy out my teaching I just I want this to be teaching prep I want expertise give me other people's time so the types of resourcing is um, really dependent on the scope and the preference and the priority of what the academics bring to it and I hope that helps some of these questions about how on earth do you resource this <laughs> So that's one that's one take on open textbooks, but but developing your own open textbook isn't isn't the only way to to go about it. And um, I want to throw to to Mace um, on on which way am I pointing? I'm not sure which which side Mace is on the screen. You're up. Okay. Uh, the uh, so so Mace, what are some other approaches you can take to to folding an open textbook into the way that you that you teach so maybe i found an existing open textbook um how can i use yeah. it yeah um um i think um sarah and amanda touched on that as well um open textbooks 
um, you can uh, have different ways of using them. And the common one probably use it as it is, adopt it into, into your subject. But other things is that you can actually find an open textbook and try to um, look at if there is actually a place for improvement there. So I came across this very interesting um, uh, collaborative statistics textbook and it was just like uh, a plain English, let's say, no uh, uh, related software that tried to explain the statistical theory. And what um, a couple of academics did is they actually used that open textbook around collaborative statistics and used uh, Microsoft Excel to give examples of the explanation of the statistical theory. And they've published their own textbook now. So there is that um, indirect benefit to open textbook that yes they do cut the cost but also through this approach of um, reuse and improve you actually have the opportunity to bring um, new knowledge um, the other um, the other approach is in engaging students in generating textbooks it's just actually a massive room for that especially when we know the large number of assessments that students generate every semester. This is some, I do describe that and I'm borrowing the term cognitive surplus that happens in, inside the classroom. But, but why I use this term actually, and it is also, I feel it's related to the, not only to students, but most people who actually contribute to, uh, with the knowledge and then share it. So, um, the cognitive surplus actually talking about why people like to share so why this human behavior happens and um, this concept actually suggests that people do that because of generosity uh, we're talking here about cognitive uh, work we're not talking about laborious work so people share because of uh, one of the reasons is generosity. So it's like intrinsic motives. They share because of the recognition and that's another motive for people to uh, create and share. So um, back to um, um, uh, one of the approaches is utilizing what happens in uh, or assessments in generating textbooks. It's just one way that um, provide an authentic learning environment actually. The students, they don't only have and we treat students as in that students and as partner we not necessarily treat them as consumer of the knowledge but also they've got so many other things that they have they can contribute with so um you're likely to have an ex someone in your classroom who is is doing uh, graphic design as a hobby but they can actually be a really um a valuable resource to contribute to developing open textbooks. So that's another approach. And uh, what we have in the Alex lab, we actually, um, and also back to that um, Mentimeter where teaching practices are actually the challenge there um, and utilizing open textbooks in, in the learning environment. We actually, in the Alex lab, we've developed five approaches to give you uh, as academics who would like to adopt um, open textbooks. Um, and to use these approaches. So there is the uh, use as is, there is revise, reuse and improve, there is curate and remix. Uh, we've got authoring from scratch and the last one, an approach to student generated content. And all these approaches, there's some case studies that help with understanding um, how to actually achieve the benefits of these five approaches. So I'll, I'll just put in the link in the chat now if someone is interested to look at those. Thanks so much, Mace. Yeah, that's a really great resource to, to look at. I'm going to throw it back over to um, the, the mentee now because um, it relates to a question. Some of the some of the responses there relate to a question that I received before um, the, the the session started from from a colleague. And um, so the, the, the question for this mentee part was what's important about open textbooks from your perspective? And two of the top answers were accessible and they are accessible. What does it mean to provision a textbook in accessible formats? Um, who wants to take that? Who wants to take that curly, curly <laughs> question? <laughs> I can respond to that quickly, David. Um, um, accessibility is, is uh, obviously a big thing and it's important 
um, in all digital assets. But when we're talking about open textbooks and textbooks in general, they provide that standard format that is accessible by uh, most screen readers. But when we're also talking about digital um, open textbooks and digital textbooks, we're talking about uh, alignment with um, accessibility, web accessibility standards. Uh, we're talking about um, content accessible by the, uh, sorry, first searchable, so discoverable, uh, and that can be done by tagging. We're talking about uh, the use of uh, alt text um, and use of um, and how to actually use tables. So all these considerations are important because we're viewing a textbook in a, in a, in a, um, in a digital format. And it is vital because um, we're talking about um, open uh, resources that don't necessarily advocate for having cheaper options, but also for inclusion and social justice. So we want to have that diverse um, group of learners actually to be able to read textbooks. Um, and uh, in the digital textbooks, um, the EPUB is the um, most accessible format of open textbooks. Uh, but what we know of the existing publishing um, textbook platforms, they provide a wide range of formats. So you can have the EPUB, um, PDFs, um, even though PDFs will limit some of the content in some of the interactive textbooks and you've got the HTML format obviously that are uh, accessible and readable by screen readers. The other one that we have but doesn't necessarily go under the um, web accessibility standards is the, um, the audio textbooks. So um, this is another ch challenging area to, to accessibility standards, not to us, but it's also provide that access uh, to people who can't, um, like blind people, for example. Mm. Can I add um, my lovely shout out to my lovely colleague, Dr. Ben Whitburn at Deakin, who is blind and teaches in the special ed master's program. And I mean, he's traveled around the world with his research. He's eminently highly abled in and skilled and um, he's, he's part of his interest in, in selecting an open textbook. Um, he wanted to update his text. That was a big thing. He was just really peeved how old the commercial text was getting and what you're having to pay for it. But then he found one that was published by University of Southern Queensland, who are another um, uh, local provider of text. And uh, it was, he said it was HTML5, which was fully screen reader. Um, compatible which for him is is just like has to be and so by him making those decisions on behalf of his students he's he's ensuring a certain level of accessibility for a range of other um, um, abilities so yeah very the the reasons and rationales and options are um, are pretty amazing so yeah I haven't I haven't had a crack at html5 for that I haven't tested in that way but if Ben says it can read it <laughs> I have faith. <laughs> Maze, a question about the audio ones. Does does it automatically read it or is it like an audio book that you know you get the author to read out the book? Well, yeah, the, the both of them actually. So there is the oh, text okay. and there is the um what we know the audio books that you you find them on um different platforms. So yeah, that's what I mean by those. Cool. Um, <laughs> you should find someone yeah. famous to read my book. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say, if you got Sean Connery to read the accounting textbook, <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna go off, or, or whatever the equivalent is. But apparently, his voice is very popular. <laughs> Fantastic! I'd love to have that um, as my as my textbook voice. Um, the uh, yeah, so so EPUB, HTML five. I mean, for people. Um, and I, I just had a quick skim of a, an article yesterday, um, which is about the U, surveying the UK, and they did say that EPUB were, were H, and HTML were generally the most accessible, um, and PDF the least. Um, I think I've got a link to that article here somewhere. Um, so, Amanda, what do you know? What form, format are you going to be presenting your your textbook? <laughs> this this in? has already been decided. I knew I knew this one. Um, so we're using Pressbooks 
which will give you an EPUB to put into an EPUB reader. Um, you can read it online. And you've also got a PDF export type of thing so that if you wanted to print it, um, then it would have links to interactive activities and video. So then there's like a QR code that you can scan that would take you to some of those. One of the things that has become an issue for us and maybe for other institutions um, is that we have lots of students in China behind the great firewall of China. And for most EPUBs, when they have, or any of the, the eBooks, whenever OERs have links to videos, 99% of times it's Vimeo or it's YouTube, something that can't be accessed behind the firewall. So for us, we've had to come up with workarounds as well for that type of thing. And for us, we've decided that a um, OneDrive folder that will have all the videos numbered and in reasonable size formats uh, will be the way that we'll provide those videos to students who are accessing from behind the firewall since they can't watch and click on the embedded YouTubes. It just wasn't possible. We looked at trying to embed a video into an H5P, but that became really unwieldy. Um, so, you know, if you have students in internet restricted countries, that's one other thing to think about. Now, um, yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic point to to raise, um, and yeah, I don't I don't I don't know if there's any simple solutions when it comes to to you know the conflict between openness and firewalls. Um, but um, Mace, I've got another question for you around um, adapting an open textbook, and it's kind of getting into the technical stuff around licensing. How do I know that I can adapt? an open a textbook i mean is, is it still an open textbook if i can't adapt it yeah um so almost all textbooks nowadays are published with one of six licenses of creative commons so uh the one we see on um on the screen are four of them um all licenses allow aside from the nd the no derivatives all of them will allow you to um use the textbook as it is, or uh, remix it with other content, or maybe generate a new uh, content out of it, except for the uh, ND. Now, um, the all licenses mean that you can use um, this content, so, and usually they're associated not only with textbooks, but in general in open, with open educational resources. And all these licenses actually makes it much easier for us to reuse others' work, as long as we attribute the original author. And this is the least restrictive uh, form of the six licenses. And the most restrictive one says that you can use the work, but you have to attribute the original author. You can't make any money of it and you can't change it. And this is the uh, uh, CC, BY, and C, and D. And in between these two licenses, there are variations, which are obviously uh, more flexible than the no derivatives. So once you say um, no derivatives, you know that you can't change it. You can only use it as it is. But all other licenses, and in academia, uh, the most common one is the uh, CC, BY, no commercial use, share alike. Um, this is the, um, the common one, but obviously, if you look at the bigger picture of open educational resources around the world, um, um, I'm, I'm not really sure, but I'm just talking in, in the Australian universities here that um, share alike, uh, no commercial use is the most common one, but uh, I can't really give a an indication of all other resources but um, the great thing about uh, creative commons licenses since they've been introduced they've actually allowed more opportunities for the work to be um, used by others uh, and to see improvement of the work in, um, um, over yeah, its lifetime so yeah these are the, um, the tools that we can use and uh, I think understanding all these um, questions around copyright and intellectual property is vital to um, step a foot in the uh, open educational resources world in general. Um, 
and it's not uh, to be honest it's not that complicated it, it is what it tells the licenses are clear and they explain um, um, yeah themselves easily um, yeah that's so that's the so it's the ND I have to look for the non-derivative that's the one yeah you still the, can use the, the work but you can't change it yeah yeah yeah, that's, that's yeah. yeah. so we are very much almost out of time but I just had it one last sort of um, uh, question around this um, about adapting open textbooks to a local context um, maybe Sarah and Amanda um, you can you can I mean, sort of all answer this in some way so what are some examples of, of ways that, that, that open textbooks can be adapted to the Australian context or and why is it important to do that well Sarah and I first talked about number one you know let's look at the businesses that are being used in accounting textbooks. It's in a lot of textbooks that we get from the United States, farm equipment, farm machine <laughs> equipment. Um, and we'd seen a lot of issues around women always had cake shops or dress shops and, you know, men had engineering businesses. Uh, so they were always, you know, or accounting businesses. So, you know, for us, adaptation and localizing is really important to give our students a feel for, you know, what the world is like, the diversity of the world, um, the representation, we want students to be able to see themselves. And, you know, I was hired at UTS partially for one of those reasons of representation. We had lots of young Asian women in our courses and very few female Asian academics teaching in the business school that they could relate to. So, you know, for us, rep you know, representation is really critical. And then for, it's also about, weaving in the complexity of the Australian business environment, um, including for us Indigenous perspectives as well. Sarah, anything else you want to add? Um, I think, yeah, it's been really fascinating. Um, you, you, you've got to have some sort of a focus, you you know, because OER is iterative. You can't just like wham, all, just layer all of that stuff in. But um, UTS has pushed to this um, new uh, global learning outcome around sort of social responsibility and Indigenous knowledge recognition. Just really, it just makes it very timely to to do some work in that area. And I think that's that's going to just just shape our focus on V1 um, and also our research into um, whether or not that then helps students have an uplift in that area. Otherwise, you know, you, you just can't, you can't do, <laughs> you can't layer everyone's voice in all the time, but you can, I think, teach students to recognise when it's, when there's a monoculture and have some critical thinking tools to just say hey look we've made an effort here this is important because here's some examples and just keep raising their critical thinking skills actually along the way so when they're looking at the next textbook if it lacks those kinds of those sorts of diversities they might also say mm, for my assignment none of these really float my boat I might actually look a bit more widely I can see you know surely there is more than than this and um, I think that's a, a really marvelous um, teachable moment and that's certainly something the academics we interviewed were really feeling um, challenged by but also optimistic that they didn't have to to try and can put everyone's voice in their textbook right away but they could at least at the beginning just acknowledge where there were gaps say look i had a look i'm trying to do better in this way i've introduced i've introduced x and y moving forward we might do a bit of a and b you know so that the academics model this sort of being open to a process of thinking through whose voices are there and missing and and that should make students have um, be able to spot that in other parts of their learning journey and in their employment space and know who should come to the table for consultation and I think that um, it just takes the pressure off an academic to just nail everything because they've acknowledged you know this is what we're trying to do and there might be more things we need to do in the future but we're going to make a start fantastic responses amazing thank you so much we are plumb out of time um, Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, May, so much. It's been really um, insightful for me personally, and I hope, and thank you everybody who came along as well. Um, I just, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really excellent space and just want to express my appreciation for everybody who, who took the time um, out of their lunch break today to, to come along.